So let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the blessings uh, that you give to us, even in the midst of tough times as a country, as a church, as individuals, you're still there. And the message of Easter still resounds in our ears, the message of the angel. He's not here, he is risen. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he's going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. We give you thanks, uh, O oh Lord, that Jesus has conquered death. He's opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers, that he is the resurrection and the life, and that because he lives, we shall live also. Bless us, O oh Lord, in the upcoming six weeks as we take a look at the great book of Nehemiah and see there several themes and messages of uh, rebuilding, repentance, growth, and also that there's hope in the midst of tough times. Be with us, O Lord, and bless our time together, for we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's, let's kind of tackle, first of all, who is Nehemiah. Look at chapter 1, and we're going to go to the last verse. The last verse, so I have to turn to page, to page 504. But the last sentence of the first chapter, which is Nehemiah 1, verse 11, the last, the last sentence now I was a cupbearer to the king. And that's going to then take us into next week, where now it's going to set up how Nehemiah ends up to kind of become the person who is sent back by King Artaxerxes of the Persians, uh, back to Judah and Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, to rebuild the city, and to be the governor of the uh, territory. But Nehemiah, an exile, so we... And, and, and we'll go through the chronology here in, in a moment. We have to remember, this is why it's great, because this fits so well with so many things we're doing here with Esther, Daniel, uh, and, and all that sort of stuff, and Hosea that we had here, 586, um, and now it was 587, 586. Anybody know what happens then, B.C.? It's the fall of what? Jerusalem. 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 Who comes in? No, they're, they're later on. Babylonians. Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. Remember? Daniel gets hauled off. His three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get hauled off. And uh, all that happens. Then along down the road here, as we're going to see, there's Cyrus, the, 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 and we'll get to this. Cyrus and the Persians take over from the Babylonians. A group returns under um, a guy maybe that you know, Zerubbabel, and then they begin kind of to do some things, but there's some halting of everything, and um, they don't really go back in mass till Ezra, which is uh, 458 B.C. So that's when Ezra goes back and begins this, and then we get 445 B.C. That's when Nehemiah and another group goes back. But we've been, we've been sitting here now for a big chunk of time here. We're looking at 140 years in exile. 140 years. And now they're going to go back. Now they're going to go back. Nehemiah is a Jew, but... What, what's interesting, and we're going to talk about this because I think this also has a lot for us to um, contemplate how we react to a pagan uh, government. And we basically have to admit right now that the United States is a pagan government. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pagan government. I mean, we're not, we're, 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 we're kidding ourselves and we think this is a Christian nation. It's not a Christian nation. It's a, it's a pagan government. How do we respond to a pagan government? What is, what is Nehemiah? I was a cupbearer to the king. What is that position? That would be pretty high, wouldn't it? Very high. Very high. Because now, let's, let's go back to a couple years ago when we did the book of Daniel. Daniel was here at the start. Remember, Daniel was here at the start. Now we've got Nehemiah down here when they return in mass back home. This is Daniel. Daniel eventually, you know, is there with Nebuchadnezzar, and he becomes the what? The prime minister. 
And we've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and those guys are major advisors to the, to the, to the king. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. The cupbearer was the guy, number one, to protect who? The king. The king, because what was his job? So he, get poisoned. he was the taste tester. Yeah. Everything that came to the king, all right, you eat it, dude. You drink it. Oh, you survive. And let's, uh, let's sit there and watch. You haven't croaked. So, okay, I'll eat and I'll drink now, too. Now, that had to be somebody that's extremely what? Trustworthy. Now, it wasn't just that. They were also in the inner circle. Some people believed that they were also in charge of the harem, which that has to be a, a very trustworthy person, that you have access and you're taking care of all the king's wives and girlfriends and concubines and everything else. But a lot of people also saw that this guy was uh, the uh, treasurer as well. So he was the uh, CFO, the chief financial officer of the kingdom. <coughs> major advisor to the king. So we got a major advisor to the king. He's not Babylonian. He's not Persian. He's a Jew. He's a Jew, and his job is to make sure the king lives. So he's kind of in charge of the secret service. He's in charge of the treasury. Maybe in charge of all the women, too. This guy is a major, major dude. Now, we think, kind of, if we've got a pagan government, our job is to what? Be in opposition to it. To um, run the militia. To kind of be like the zealots in Jesus' day and run around and kill the Romans. Which is why Barabbas is in jail. We heard that Good Friday. He was wanted for insurrection and murder in the city. We think our job is to whack the uh, pagan rulers. Daniel isn't whacking anybody. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego aren't whacking anybody. Nehemiah isn't whacking anybody either. His job is to actually make sure that the king, survive. the king survives. Now that that is a very interesting thing here to kind of think about as we think about who this is, I'm having a conquered person be now in charge of my well-being and the well-being of the whole kingdom. That's an interesting thing to kind of contemplate. And it's the same sort of thing of where Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego were at. The, you know, go ahead, Cindy. Because, but basically what it comes down to is that God told the people when they were going to go into captivity... To Don't seek the welfare yeah. of the people where, yeah. where I have put you. And seek the welfare of the city. Provided for. That's right. Right. Which, but I, I never really, okay, with doing the VI now, it's like, okay, that just blew everything. And But now, we're going to get to it too. Think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that we did. I go along with things so far, but then they asked me to bow down to the golden statue when the little bell rings. Ding, ding, ding. Everybody now bow down. No, I, I will. I must obey God rather than man. I'll I'll help you out. I'll seek your welfare. I'll do everything. But I'm not going there. here. I'm not going here. And so there's there's something to keep in mind too. But let's let's quickly kind of run through a little bit of the rest of the chronology here. You've got in um, five. 38 B.C. is the decree of Cyrus. And we, we remember here with uh, Daniel, he's, he's there. He kind of fallen out of favor, if you remember the book of Daniel. Comes back in as the Persians now are, remember, digging in under the, under the river and everything else and coming in under the, the, the city walls and the gate. And they're having the big party and everything else. And that's when they have the handwriting on the wall and uh, the uh, king's mom says, hey, there used to be a guy here who could understand all this stuff. Why don't we go find him? And they go get Daniel, and remember the handwriting on the wall is, you're Kaputskis, all right? You're done. It's, it's, it's over for you. And, and the Persians come in and wipe them out. Then Cyrus comes in, and he says, hey, you guys can go back. But not everybody goes back. Because is there anything to go back to? 
No, everything has been destroyed. The temple built by Solomon um, at this point in time, about 400 years earlier, gone. City walls, gone. Burned. Everything, the whole city of Jerusalem, destroyed. So what are you going to go back to? We've been here now for 50 years. This is, this is home. So some of them go back in 533. That's Zerubbabel. You can read about that in, 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 in other books. Zechariah, it's a little bit in Ezra, and so forth. He's, he's, he's the governor. He goes back. He's a priest. They begin to set up the tribe of Levi. They, they try to rebuild some of the temple and, and do some stuff. It kind of stops and starts. They rebuild the altar. Then the temple kind of gets rebuilt. Uh, they begin rebuilding in about 532, halted in 531. Then in 520, they resume work again on it. By 515 B.C., the temple is rebuilt. The temple is rebuilt. The rest of the city, not so much. They did some work, a little bit of some work on the walls and everything else, but the city's pretty much in shambles. But they went back, which says something very interesting. The first thing is, we built a church. We get, the, we get the temple taken care of. And so things are kind of cruising along until we get to Ezra, and Ezra goes back, and things have kind of fallen apart, and he goes back, and he begins to work on the temple too, and kind of uh, do more with, he's a scribe, so he's going to do kind of the uh, teaching, preaching. Their, their, their spiritual understanding totally messed up. Uh, they're intermarrying, their, their, their understanding of God, worship, kind of all messed up because it's just a conglomeration of all religions put together. And so Ezra now is going to kind of begin to do some work and everything else. And then in the book of Nehemiah here, there's a delegation that comes back led by Nehemiah's brother, who's kind of the captain of the garrison there. So think he's a soldier. We're going to run into him. He comes back and says, the place is a mess. It's just a mess. Something's got to be done. The religious aspect, a mess. Spiritual aspect, a mess. Yeah, the temple is, is rebuilt, but ah, the people don't understand it. What we're going to see is Nehemiah, they actually find the scriptures. The scriptures have been lost. So, and there'll be a reading and the people will weep. The scriptures are recovered. They're beginning to understand, hey, I can't take everybody's religion and throw them into one. They're not all the same because, of course, they recover the commandments. What's keeping things going is the stories that are being told from father to son to grandson and so forth. But now we have a recovery of the scriptures. They find the scrolls, everything else, and then they begin rebuilding the walls. Now, we think they're rebuilding the wall so they can protect the people in the city and everything else, but as we're going to see, they're rebuilding the walls so that they can protect the, the temple and the priests and the scribes that serve there. And because we need to keep that going, and then more importantly, to protect the people who are in there, because who's going to come ultimately from those families that are in there? The Messiah. So that if they die, there is no Jesus. There's no Christmas, there's no Holy Week, there's no Easter. So that's, that's kind of um, what's, what's all going on here. And they'll, they'll uh, rebuild the walls here. And there'll be a rebuilding of a whole bunch of other stuff that's going to happen. So what we're, what we're going over here is kind of the, the major history of the prophets after the fall into Jerusalem. And we started with Daniel, now we're picking things up when, for the most part, we're going to have the major return back home here under Nehemiah. And the outline of the book, there's 13 chapters, the outline of the book is pretty simple. It's a pretty simple outline. The first part, 1 through 6, is going to deal with the physical aspects of things. Coming, rebuilding the wall, we're going to deal with external stuff, outside stuff. 
7 through 13 is now we're going to deal with the spiritual aspect. And there's some carryover here, of course, between the two. And now this is more external. This is going to be now internal. That's going to be kind of the breakdown of the uh, book. Chapters 1 through 6, securing Jerusalem, rebuilding the walls, everything else. And then 7 through 13, now it's going to be more spiritual needs, and it's going to be caring for God's people. The theme of the book, very quickly, is, I think, one that's very important for us as we're, in, as we're going to see this, is that God's in control. God's in control, even when it looks like everything is lost. And that's what it looked like Good Friday. When we left Good Friday, if you were here, it's dark, Jesus, God's died. Jesus died. It's dark. Looks like all's lost. Looks like the enemies have won. Go home. But we know it's not the end of the story because the Christ candle went out, came back in early Easter sunrise in the dark. Christ candle comes back in, the lights come on, we hear the Easter gospel, he's risen. And it, it, it fits very well with the psalmists over and over and over again where they say, be still. Know that I am God. That's right. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. And we're going to see that in Nehemiah's life, especially here in chapter 1 in a moment. Going to sit down. I, I, I would have heard the news, all's lost. They'd say, well, who's in charge? Who's the bomb that's in charge? We've got to get somebody else in charge. All right? Let's, 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 get, let's get somebody there who knows what they're doing. What do we need to do? I'm the type of guy. Let's fix it. Immediately. Alright? What's the problem? Who do we got to get there? Who are the people we got to get in specific spots to get the job done? Nehemiah hears, oh boy, this is bad. And I've heard it from my brother. Alright? He's there. He's the captain of the garrison. <laughs> Things are bad, bro. Alright? What are we going to do? Um, I'm going to pray for five months. Really? That's, that's, that's your answer. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to pray night and day for five months. Oh, really? Huh. Not what I would have done. But maybe there's some things here to learn from that. And he is praying that God is going to actually use him because he's the main advisor to the, to the king. And it's something how God works. Because remember, the people that survived here in the interim with all this too, because we did the book of Esther. That God, maybe, you know, as Mordecai says, maybe God put you here for such a time as, as this. And so God is always raising up people that shouldn't be where they're at to kind of save the day. I mean, Esther, how does she end up becoming the queen? I mean, a Jew? I mean, how, how, does, how does Nehemiah end up becoming the main advisor? How does Daniel end up becoming the main advisor? How does Cyrus end up taking over the Babylonian Empire and says, you know what? You guys can start going back home. God's in control. Even in the midst of what we're seeing right now. And he's always doing things on a different timetable. And he's always going to raise up somebody that we would never expect to come out of nowhere to get the job done. And who that is, I don't know. But we also have to remember, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. You know, it's, it's going to be, maybe we're going to face some really tough times. But God is actually going to be working through that. Because you have to remember, the tough times is, when we were studying like the book of Isaiah and everything else at the start of COVID, and Romans 1 and everything else, Isaiah came and said, hey, this place is going to fall. They're like, no, it's not. No, it's not. We're God's chosen people. This is, this is God's chosen kingdom, man. He ain't going to let us fall. So party on. Rock on. We got the green light because we're God's chosen nation. I think sometimes in the United States we think we are. same thing. God's not going to let us fall. He's not going to let the United States go down. And he actually may take the United States down in order to save his people and the church. That's And so, because he wants to bring us, ultimately, which is another theme 
of the book of Nehemiah to bring us to repentance. And if the United States is rocking and rolling and everything else, we may not repent. So we may have to come and just cut us down in order that we do repent. So the main theme is God's in control. God is going to provide for the spiritual needs and the physical needs of his people. And he's, he's going to do it sometimes through some interesting people and in interesting ways. And not always according to our timetable. Because we think, too, we should pray and then, Amen. Where is it? We're waiting. Five years later. You know? Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 100 years, 125 years, 140 years. I was, I was watching some things yesterday morning when I was exercising. All about kind of getting some things squared away in my mind here for this woke Bible study. And I'm going to show some clips and some other things. So I'm watching some stuff and listening to some stuff on my phone. One of the things I was listening to was Matt Walsh from the Daily Wire, who's kind of he's the guy that wrote the book What Is a Woman and did the did the movie What Is a Woman and everything else. And he was talking about so many different things. But his whole point was is we think, okay, we should be able to do something and we're going to turn this around. And he said, folks, this is, this is a generational thing. He said, I, I may be in the grave, and we still have it. And he's, what, 40? Mm -hmm. he's, he, I may be in the grave 40, 50 years from now, and this thing isn't turned around. Folks, this isn't going to happen overnight. And we have to look at it. God is working through all this, and it's going to be a long time, and it's going to be in His way and in His time. And that's, that's a major theme that we're going to see here. In the, in the book of Nehemiah. It takes a long time. I mean, they go 150 years before the Scriptures are recovered. And have we lost the Scriptures today in our country? Absolutely. And especially within the church. Yes. And another theme we're going to see in the book of Nehemiah, of Nehemiah is repentance doesn't start with me calling the pagan government to repentance. It starts with me and the church. What do I need to repent of? Mm -hmm. Nehemiah in his prayer is going to start with, Oh Lord, I know we don't deserve any help from you because of the sins of your people and the sins of your church and because of the sins of my family and myself. I'm to blame for this mess that we're in. Not the pagan government, not this political party, not this liberal church. It's me. And so, uh, the, as, as we look at the book of Nehemiah, there's so many things I think we're going to be able to learn here from all this. But, but God's concern for the spiritual and the eternal salvation and the physical needs of His people is going to be there. And they're going to... It's, it's not just a book. So many people think it's a cool book about Nehemiah coming in and rebuilding the walls. And that's the arch book version of it, you know, that's for the kids. But we're going to go kind of way beyond what all of that is because it's the walls are going to be there to protect the temple so that the sacrifices continue which is the Old Testament sacraments there's forgiveness because that's the place that God dwells to protect the priests the scribes the proclamation of the gospel and to protect the line the remnant that will ultimately produce the Messiah the Savior which was the whole book of Esther if the Jews are exterminated it can't happen because there's no, there's no Jesus. There's no Jesus. It's got to come. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And if they're, they're all dead, it ain't going to happen. Okay, so like with the temple, God didn't have to allow that to be destroyed. But he did. Was it because the abominations of the people? It was like, I'm done with Going this. Going back here when the temple's destroyed? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, no. you're done. Because you guys think you're in just because you're... Showing up. It's interesting. And it, because he says, remember, I don't want your stupid sacrifices anymore. I don't want your empty prayers. You think you're just going through the motions. Which I think today in the church, we're just going through the, we're just going through the motions. Well, when, yeah, no, go ahead. When sir. you have churches that don't even have Good Friday services, 
A Christian church? Seriously? Okay, maybe not Monday, Thursday, but that should. But that we're just, is we're nuts. just we've we've lost the meaning of an understanding of who God is and who we are. Yes. And we're just it's it, it's a good old boys club and we're just doing these things to check boxes. And actually Monday, Thursday because of communion, but they don't look at communion the way the real presence. No. Yeah. No. No, there's they nothing there. Monday more. Because Lent's over. They celebrate yeah. that more. They, 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 they Lent. Yeah. I mean, you think oh, yeah. Yes, they do. They celebrate Monday more than they do the whole month of, or the whole time of oh, Lent. Oh, yeah. How patient he is, too, because these things go go on. Not only does it take a long time for for him to decide to reverse course, but he go he's patient and lets it go and go and go because this has been going on for a long, long, long time. Right. Hope. I mean. I know that he knows all, but get, uh, giving opportunities to repent. Correct. That's the whole point. I mean, because by the time Jerusalem, the first time, is destroyed, that's gone on a long, long, long time. Yeah. Yeah, it has. It, it, I mean, it's the same thing with, you know, with, like, we think with the United States. I mean, yeah. I mean, we see may, like, I mean, it may be miserable for a long time. It may be. Yeah, it may be that our, our kids, grandkids, great grandkids, I mean, that. That would that would take me to great great grandkids, and it, and it may be that that's how long yeah. things Who go. Thinks, or it may be the Lord survive. Or or the Lord may come again tonight or See, yeah. a week from now. That because be awesome. we're which is another <laughs> thing that I've been again. God knows, but we're we're in a position right now we've never been in the history of the world. We have never been messed up on male and female. To the extent that we are today, this artificial intelligence yeah, yeah. with our technology, we're in a position that we think we can play God. How long He lets that roll, that's His choice. But we're we're in a position now, and see, we always sit here. How could these people have been so evil, folks? We're we're watching stuff happen right now. Murdering millions of unborn. Yeah, the the, the abortion. The, the, these people never thought. No, we, man, these people are horrible pagans, folks. We're I always sit here and I thought as college I was a history major. You know, how, how, how did Nazi Germany happen? How did, how did there, all this stuff happen? Well, we're, 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 we're looking at it. It's happening right now. Nothing is new. Nothing is new. No. Because we have technology. And with technology, it's more what? Technology, the only thing, it, it just takes the old stuff and makes it quicker. We're, we're on a more rapid deceleration than ever before. Yeah, Kyle? When you talk about looking at the history and looking at world history and you look at the history of nations and the average life of a nation is 250 years. And what, what are we coming up on as America? 250 years. You know, 1776, you know, what's 250 years later? Three years from now. Babylon never thought they'd be gone. No, yeah. and they didn't last that long. Yeah. You know, Babylon didn't... But they were very didn't. high up there, and then yeah. they, they and really they, had much further to... Because it ends up to be that the kids don't have to work for anything. It's it's the rise and fall. It's the cycle of every nation. They're you don't have to work. Down. You don't have to do anything. You live a very uh, affluent, decadent lifestyle, and every society with that will collapse. Yeah. The, the irony is economic prosperity does you in. So the better you do, the, the faster, faster the farther you fall, the faster you fall. But you also yeah. fall farther from God. You don't Correct. depend upon Him anymore. You right. depend upon all the other stuff. Right. Because I don't need Him because I'm cruising along just fine without Him. No, you're exactly right. Except death comes for us all, and that's that's the equalizer. But not acknowledging that He provided it. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is what exactly what Moses' sermon was before they entered the Promised Land. You're going to get in there, and he goes, I'm going to tell you exactly how this is all going to go down. You're going to get in there, your flocks are going to increase, you're going to build fine houses, you're going to settle down, your silver and gold are going to increase, and then you're going to say to yourselves, look at what I've done, baby. Eat, drink, and be married. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same thing. And see, you have to understand, so then when Jesus tells the parable of the rich fool, he's actually, see, all of Jesus' parables come from the Old Testament. He's actually taking Moses' sermon. Look at what I have had a great crop. Look at what I have done. I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to add on to my house. Look at what I've done. This is my goal. This is my crop. This is my house. This is my barn. 
And then Jesus says, you fool. This night you're going to have the big one. You're going to have a heart attack. Your soul's going to be demanded of you. Then who's going to get all that you've stored up for yourself? But all Jesus does in his parables is take things from the Old Testament and put them into, from the scriptures, which is the scriptures of the day, and turn them into modern day. It's a modern day sermon based upon Old Testament texts. And that's, and, and that's just the life cycle for our own individual lives, and it's the life cycle of every nation. And that's, and that's what we've got. And, and I think finally to kind of close this, this intro, so we get into the, the, the first chapter here, I think Nehemiah's big thing that we're going to learn here from him is that, yes, he's kind of got political goals, but his goals are more spiritual and theological than they are political. And it's his faith that informs and guides his political actions that are more importantly put into place to protect the spiritual well-being of the people of Judah and, and uh, Israel. So any, any questions about kind of the short little intro here into, uh, into uh, the book? Otherwise, let's, let's, let's just, if there's no question, let's just jump into uh, Nehemiah. Let's go to chapter 1. And read verses 1 through 3. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev. That's kind of November, December for us. In the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital. So this isn't, you know, Philip Sousa and everything else. This is... Uh, or John Philip Sousa, yeah, the, the guy, the, the music guy, the music man here. Let's, let's kind of, this is modern day Iraq. Because who thought he was the new Nebuchadnezzar but Saddam Hussein? Mm -hmm. And when our soldiers went over there, you can actually talk to them. They got to see the ruins of Babylon. Hanging gardens, Nebuchadnezzar, they, they were the wonders of the world. So, to kind of give you the, the, the feel of where we're at here with kind of my makeshift map. Alright, here is, alright, this is, right here, this is, this is Palestine. This is the Holy Land. This is the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. Alright, here's Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Okay, capital Jerusalem where Jesus is born, Nazareth. This is where Jesus grows up. Capernaum, right over here on the sea. So this is, this is the area that we've got, you know, most of the New Testament, and then the Old Testament where they're always kind of hanging out and doing all their things here. Now you've got the Persian Gulf sitting over here, 800 to 1,000 miles away, with the two major rivers flowing in here. All right, to this body of water that's down here, the Persian Gulf. And this is... The modern day country of Iraq. And then you got Iran, which is Persia. So Iraq is the old Babylon. Iran is the old Persian Empire. And they've always been knocking at each other. Alright, so you've got Babylon sitting here. Susa is down here. This is the winter capital. Because it's so hot in the summer, and this is what our troops would talk about when they were there, 130 degrees, you know, to where it's just unbearable. So there was, so there was the ancient city of Babylon, and then there was Susa down here, where they'd go in the winter, where it was a little bit cooler, because it's up in the hills. Alright? So they are, they are here, and he's, this is November, December, this is winter, we're, we're 800 to 1,000 miles away. So he's now in Susa. This is during the winter. He's in the capital, which is the winter capital, that to Hananiah, which is shortened for Hananiah. And we actually find Hananiah in extra biblical sources with some stuff that was actually done with some reports. So this is Nehemiah's brother, who's some sort of military garrison guy, back over here. He's going to come back with a report that he's going to give to the king and to his brother. So it just happens, he's hanging out there in Susa in the capital, verse 2, that Hanani, one of my brothers,
came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning <coughs> Jerusalem. So these were the people who had gone back earlier, when I had the chronology here on the board, the 15 years earlier with Ezra. So they had, they had gone back, and they're there, and they're kind of starting to rebuild some things, and do some stuff there with the temple, also doing some stuff with the walls, but then the walls get knocked down, both by some enemies around, and also by the Persian Empire. Because if you're going to build walls, who are you protecting yourself from? Us! And we're the ones who are um, your protectors. You're under our rule. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. But comes back here, and uh, there's this report. We get it in verse 3. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. Now, for them, what, is that, what does that mean, great trouble and shame? You have to think of it as a Jew, as a believer. They're in trouble and shame. Look at it this way. Are they faithful or unfaithful? unfaithful. They're unfaithful. They're unfaithful. They're unfaithful to God. They're unfaithful to His covenant. They're unfaithful to one another. They're in great trouble. They're in great shame. The walls too. So I'm, I'm going to give my report. I'm going to start with the internal state of the people. Unbelief, sin, rebellion against God. That's my first report. Second report, physical aspects of things. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates have been destroyed by fire. Everything is in shambles. So he brings bad news. Walls are down. Gates have been destroyed by fire. The Persians have stopped the building of the walls. Uh, they let us, as you know, rebuild the temple to a certain extent. But the rest of it ain't going to happen. And... Um, we're in trouble. Let's hit the pause button there for a moment. Let's go back to Nehemiah. He's in the capital. Remember the end of the chapter, which we'll get to, verse 11. I was a cupbearer to the king. This guy, Nehemiah, is big time. He's a big time advisor. Um, and uh, we have to think for... For Artaxerxes, the Persian king, to give Nehemiah this type of power, he's got to be a uh, pretty admirable guy. Un un unquestionable loyalty, trustworthiness. And uh, the king's got complete trust now in a Jew. And so um, you have to kind of remember that. And it's just really an, a totally amazing thing here. So let's, let's, let's look then at uh, verse 4. Let's uh, go to that here. What's, what's Nehemiah's response? Verse 4, what is, what is Nehemiah's response? Yeah, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down, wept, mourned, and I continued. Fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, I want us to think about Nehemiah here. That's why we kind of hit the pause button and kind of thought about this. This, this guy must have incredible traits that he becomes, as an exile, a cupbearer, um, an advisor, maybe the head of the treasury. I mean, he, he's put in charge of the money. If you're put in charge of the money, you got to be a pretty trustworthy cat. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to let anybody be in charge of the money. And if he's in charge of the harem too, I'm, I'm letting this guy be in charge of my women and my money. <laughs> those are, as, a, as an ancient king, those are my prized possessions. And this guy is also making sure that I don't kick the bucket. I mean, those are the three most important things. Don't get dead. Keep my money. And keep my women. 
Th those are that, that those are my three priorities in life. All right, those are my three priorities in life, and this guy's in charge of those priorities. And as we're going to see too, this guy is an incredible organizer because he's running all these things. I mean, just think of it: who, who running the United States today uh, it, with with no computers, no telephones? The guy's in charge of the Secret Service. The guy's in charge of the of the of the Treasury. The guys the guy's in charge of everything. He's got to be an incredible organizer, a great communicator, a great administrator. I mean, this guy must be really something else. It's truly amazing. Cindy, you have something? And also then God preserved the faith in him, so he knows, I mean, he's doing right. And he's also, I mean, so yes, a very it? faithful man. Yeah. All these things are all gifts from God. Because God's giving it to this guy because he's going to raise him up to do some unbelievable things. Because we're talking about how the scriptures and everything, you know, were lost. Right. So, for his parents? Or something, yeah, it shows, yeah, the importance of godly parents, and it just shows the importance of God's grace. Yes. That everything's a gift. And God has given Nehemiah some incredible gifts. And we're going to see him here in this study in this book, a very vigorous man, energetic man, a gifted man, a great leader, a great communicator, a great motivator. He's a man of action. And you see it, you have to be to be running all these things. It, can't, it, just, it has to be incredible. But now he hears everything's gone to pot from his brother. So everything's gone to pot. The remnant there, they're in trouble and shame. Internally, spiritually, pff, everything's in trouble. Physically, externally, everything's pff, in trouble. So now this man, who's always a man of action, who gets things done. You don't, you don't run a kingdom in the ancient world without being a man of action who gets things done. So now you would expect, wouldn't you? See, that's where you have to hear the story as the ancient world would hear the story. Oh, trouble. This guy normally, boom, here's what we're going to do. I, I, I've already got a, a formulated a plan of action. I'm going to tell my brother, you're going to go back. Who are the three guys that you trust to do this? Who are the three guys that you trust to do this? Here's the plan of action. Man, we're going to, we're going to get this thing done. In verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, see, this is what's got it for the person who's hearing this first. It's got to slap them upside the head. He's always a guy of, okay, action. As soon as I heard these words... What did I do? I sat down. That's, that's an incredible thing for this guy. I sat down. This is never a guy who sits down. He's always action. Go, 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 go. We're going we're gonna to accomplish these things. I sat down. That, that's, that's already just amazing. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down. Then what's the next thing he did? He wept. Now, I one of the things last week is... I try to listen to sermons and podcasts when I do dishes. So I was listening to a sermon uh, from a pastor who actually did a series on Nehemiah. And he zeroed in on verse 4, and he had a whole half an hour sermon on verse 4. And just kind of went through the five things that Nehemiah did. But he connected him to America today. And said, when was the last, down, last time we actually sat down and actually wept for America? We're always angry, we're ticked, we're yelling, we're screaming, and everything else. You morons in Washington, you know, and everything else, and cuss everybody else. Get on the radio, man, and let's yell at everybody, and, 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 and get all ticked off. He hears everything is it's from his brother. It's trustworthy, it comes from my brother, I, I, I trust him. And so he sat down, and he wept. And then this pastor, who's always, he's, he's a good pastor, he, he always connects it to Jesus. And he said, this reminds me of who? Jesus, when he wept over when Jerusalem. When he left over the city of Jerusalem. When he comes in on Palm Sunday, and he sits there, and he weeps. When he curses the fig tree. Yeah. And, and he, also and he, the hen gathering her chicks. Yeah, like, oh, I, I, I just wanted to gather you together like a mother hen gathers her chicks. But you were not willing. That's right. And so Jesus weeps 
He weeps. These are the people who are going to kill him. I walk in you, wretched <laughs> bums. Look at what I've all done and I'm going to do for you. And now you turn your back on me. Now he weeps. And that's why in Nehemiah, as I said before too, there's a lot of godliness and Christ-likeness in, in Nehemiah. And especially as we're going to get to his prayer. There's a lot that reminds us as we're going to read his prayer here in a moment of the Lord's Prayer. It's kind of an amazing thing. He sits down. He weeps. I think we need to do a little bit more of that over the state of our church in the United States and the country. So he weeps, and then what does he do? Mourns. Mourns. Just, it's, 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 it's like we, we died. And, 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 and we have. And so he weeps. And he mourns. And it isn't for five minutes. This is, this is for days. And as we'll look and get into chapter 2 next week, there's that time period that goes by, depending upon how the ancient months work. And I'm not going to get into all that. I, I read in this one Concordia commentary, uh, Dr. St uh, Steinman, there's a Concordia of Chicago, spends, I don't know, 50 pages dealing with the ancient calendar system. And it's like, as I was reading all that, I'm like, this is a complete waste of time. Skip, go to the next. You know, but it was just kind of like, for the most part, you know, it's kind of like there's, there's, there's three, to, depending upon what calendar you're using. He's sitting down, weeping and mourning for three to five months. Three to five months. Okay, three to five months. I don't care. Three months is a long time. Five months is a long time. It's one, one. somewhere in between three days, <laughs> three hours. All right, would be a long time to, to sit down and to weep and to mourn. But as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Before the God of heaven. Of heaven. There, there's so much, like I said, one pastor preached a half an hour sermon on this one verse that you could sit down and talk about those five things. Sitting down, weeping, mourning, fasting, and praying before the God of heaven. But as I started this, so often we sit down and we think, you know, the last thing that I can do, all I can do, I've tried everything, now all I can do is pray. You know, we've, we've all said that before. All we can do now is pray. The first thing he does is what? Pray. Pray. And, and the fasting there is, is that spiritual discipline to remind us of what Jesus says when he's tempted before Satan. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's, it's that bread that comes down from heaven. That Now everything is dependent upon God. His, his action here now is not the last resort. For Nehemiah, it tells us a little bit more about this man. This man who's a man of action, he's not a lazy bum. This guy is a mover and shaker. And I sit down, I weep, I mourn, I fast, and I pray. And I think maybe that needs to be a little bit more of what we need to be doing here as well, as we engage in these spiritual disciplines. Because also we need to acknowledge God is in control. It's going to be at His time, so what does He want? That's right. From us. Right, and that's where you're... you're Cindy, okay, we're done. Amen. Because that, no, that's, that's exactly where Nehemiah is going to go. I am turning this all over to Him, and I'm going to pray for God's mercy. What is it then that God wants us to do? But that He's in control, I'm, no. I'm not. And He's working all things out, Romans 8, for the good of those who love Him are called according to His purpose. And so this is, this is going to be amazing as we kind of work through this whole thing. And we're going to learn a lot here about prayer. And the application is going to be here. What does this teach us about prayer? You know, we saw here in verse 4, he does this for days. Look at verse 6, which we'll get to here in a moment. But, but read it right now. When we get into his prayer, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night. For the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. So he, he's doing this for days, day and night. Then you go to verse 11. O oh Lord, let your ear be attended to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today. Today, 
every day, day, night, for days, for months. The application here is this really gets us to think about some serious questions about our own discipline in our daily prayer. Yes, Kyle. Um, and I think something important to point out is something that I did in college was I would go to uh, the chapel, it's actually the sanctuary at Concordia, and I looked through the front of the Lutheran hymnal. Um, and in our Lutheran hymnal, on page 313, if you look, there's prayers for the nation, for responsible citizenship, for peace, in times of war, and on and on. But um, there are a lot of helpful prayers. I mean, and before that, there are prayers for baptismal life. And, I mean, just all sorts of situations. So I think it's important that we use our, if you have a Lutheran service book at home, use it. Use your catechism. And that's what, this fall, when we go over the catechism, that's what, there's so much comfort that can be brought from those prayers and intercessions. And, and let that, let that well. be the start that gets right. you going. Because people say, Pastor, I don't know yeah. what to pray for. There again, there's already stuff from the scriptures put in there. That's my starting point. And then from there, I branch out with my own intercessions intermingled within that. And that's what Luther would do, is he'd pray the catechism, as I talked about earlier, for, for a couple hours a day, where he talked about, okay, what's the first commandment? Lord, you've told me, you shall have no other gods. I want to let you know, I've got so many gods in my life, and I need to repent. Please forgive me. And he'd list them. Please help me. Our people, my church, we have so many gods. So then, what, what are my sins? It's that introspection of this, um, basically that, that, that brings out the stuff deep within us to where prayer then becomes having a conversation with God. And I can't remember who it was that I read about Martin Luther. He had, they, they walked by early in the morning when because you know, windows were open. There's no air conditioner, you know, all that sort of stuff. Heard Luther praying. And you have to remember the prayer back then and in the Old Testament, you prayed out loud. And and um, this, this person, I don't know if it was Melanchthon or somebody else, or his pastor, Bugenhagen or whatever, said, I walked by and I heard him praying and having a conversation, and it made me feel like God was actually in the room with him. And, and, and they were having this conversation. And I think that's kind of a part of what I think we have to understand. And, and it is, well, because of course God is in the room. He's in with us right now. He's sitting here, here, here. He's, he's everywhere. But it's that familiarity with the Word and who God is and that comfort level. It's like Luther would say, you know, when I come to pray, I sit down in Jesus' lap and as, as a dear, you know, uh, child, son would talk to his father. You know, as we see in the catechism. That's, that's when, when he gets to the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. And that, that because that was really kind of where Luther's prayer life was. And so I think as we work our way through this, we're going to see Nehemiah at several stages... Always going to the Lord in prayer. It's kind of like, what a friend we have in Jesus. You know, do we find ourselves filled with so many things and worries? You know, uh, who can find a friend so faithful? You know, take it to the Lord in prayer. And, and, and that's what we kind of have here. And, and we see that. And I think we have to, for all of us, ask, and maybe I think this is where we can do some work as we uh, start this fall going through the catechism in our Sunday morning Bible studies, or we're going to do it with the, the confirmation kids at the same time and hopefully bring their parents in as well and as, and as a congregation with our whole Bible study. But can we get to the point of understanding prayer and, and kind of begin to pray like Nehemiah? And so let's, let's jump into that because that's the second half of chapter 1. Until we close here, let's look at what many people consider to be one of the greatest prayers in all the Bible, which is verse 5 through 11 to the end of chapter 1. And so let's read that because he... He, he sits down, he weeps, he mourns, he fasts, he prays to the God of heaven. Verse 5, and I said, here's the prayer. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. 
We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples, which God did. But if you return to me, repent, and keep my commandments and do them, though you are outcasts in the uttermost parts of heaven. From there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. There it is. Who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king, but the prayer ended... Right there. Now let's 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 look at some things here and let's set up. This is a four-part prayer. Well, the, really, it for, reminds me. Well, it reminds go ahead. me of Luther's prayer, casting all our burdens upon the Lord. Right, because you know. he cares. Because he cares for because us. Because he cares for us. Yeah, which is what Jesus says. Yeah. So five through six a is he starts out his prayer with, "O oh Lord, you're you're God, you're great." So he starts out with God. Hear my prayer. You're the one true God. And we'll, we'll pack, unpack this a little bit more here in a second. 6b through 7 is our unfaithfulness, our sin. One of the main things in worship and prayer is to first start out with who's God, to remember Who's God and to remember who I am? He's God, I'm not. Who am I? I'm a filthy, rotten bum. Or, let's just use Luther's words, a maggot sack. That's what he loved to call himself. So, I am, I am a poor, miserable sinner. My unfaithfulness, the unfaithfulness of the church, the unfaithfulness of the nation, the unfaithfulness of me and my family. Then... What's, what's the only hope is to remember that God is faithful. Remember all your promises? Reminding God of what He had said, which more importantly reminds me of what God has said. And then verse 11 is, the Lord's in control. And I'm back to God again, and Lord, I pray that you would not give me what I deserve, but that you would be gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. So, how to pray? Before we get there, notice he ends with ends with God, starts with God. Ends with God, starts with God. And I think this is a this is a very, you know, our Lord's disciples come to Jesus, teach us how to pray, he gives us the Lord's Prayer. I think. We can learn how to pray by looking at prayers like this. As we look at verse 5 and 6a, he begins with praise and adoration. He tells God about God. Which is very... God already, of course, knows it. But he tells God... He speaks back to God what God has first spoken to us. The importance of that... Why do we do that? The importance of that is to remember God is God and we are... He's creature. Yeah, we're not the creator, we're the creature. And in a roundabout way, that's so important because it puts everything into perspective. And the problems begin to be a lot smaller because now it's not like I have to solve them. And I think we have to remember that as we look at everything here today. Problems in the church, problems in the country, problems in our own families, problems in my own life. Everything's falling apart. But what does he pray? Oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. He's re he just remember what he's just heard. Everything is pfft. just kind of like what we turn on the news today and everything is pfft. And we look at our own life and everything is pfft. I mean, it's just where it's at. O oh Lord, the God of heaven, be still, as the psalmist says, and know that I'm God. You're not. How does, how does Jesus begin? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. He's, he's telling God about God. He's speaking back to God what God has first spoken to us. It's, it's, it's the same thing. And we have to remind ourselves, there's still a God in heaven. 
It's, 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 uh, I can't remember. It was my mom quoting my grandma, or I don't know, my mom just saying it. But, uh, you know, everything just, when we get ourselves all worked up, we have to remember, Jesus is still on the throne. You know, he's still, he's still the God of heaven. What, he, he's on vacation right now, or Satan's pulled him off the throne, or, you know, it's kind of, when uh, Luther was in that Great Depression, you know, they lost a child, everything else. He's doing funeral after funeral after funeral. The plague's gone through. Everything, everything is there in Luther's life. And, and Katie comes in, and she's all dressed up in black and mourning and everything else. And Luther goes, oh, no, not another one of the kids have died. D -d -d don't, 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 don't tell me any more bad news. And uh, she goes, yeah, well, I've got some news. God's dead. It's over for him. He's kaputz. We're just like, what? Yeah, God's dead, man. It's over. There's no hope. There's like, what, what are you talking about? She goes, that's the way you're acting. So, God must be dead because that's the way you're acting. So, I'm going to play the part too. And Luther said, kind of woke me up a little bit. How God used her. Yeah. I, you know, you have to remember that, you know, God is still the God of heaven. He still is risen from the dead. He's in charge. And so... That's the first important part. Quickly, the next important part, looking at 6b through 7. So we start out telling God about God. We start out with God. You're the God of heaven. You're in control. I'm not. You're the one who's died for me. You love me. You know, that's, that's how prayers start with. Then, so we got to get God right, who he is. The next part is, now I've got to remind myself who, who I am. And so let's look at that 6b through 7. So then he says, I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the Jesus. sins of the people. Think about even a worship service. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now it happens. I, a poor, miserable sinner. Follows the same flow. Follows exactly the same flow. Hey, well, where do you get this stuff? From the Bible. You know, our, our, our liturgy comes right, it's, 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 it's there all the time. It's, it's there all the time. I confess, all right, the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, and thought word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. But it's not just those people out there. It's even I and my father's house have sinned. What's the real reason for the tragedy? You know, he, he heard there from his brother, commander of the garrison, the remnant, they're in the province, they're still, the, those that are still alive, great trouble and shame. Spiritual trouble, spiritual sins. Internal, external, the walls broken down, gates destroyed, everything's in a shambles. Everything's a disaster. Who's to blame? Well, who's the governor there right now? Doggone it, who's the sheriff? All right, who's, who's, who, who are the priests? What's, what's going on? What's his, what's his, what's his answer? We have, we have sinned. What's ultimately wrong with our country? We have sinned. What's ultimately wrong with the country? Me. Now, I had it in a sermon about four weeks ago or, or so, but I, I thought it, it was interesting just to read it again because it was in one of the commentaries that... Uh, I was using here for this, but I, I think the application here is, is, is so important. What's wrong with our country today? It's where we were at a hundred years ago, almost exactly, in Great Britain, as everything's fallen apart. All right, World War I, you got to remember, World War I for Europe is hell. I mean, it's, it's, it's just horrible. And so then they, they send out the question, the Times of London... What's the real reason for the problems that we're in in the British Empire? And they send that out. Please write an essay and send it back to the Times of London. And maybe enough people will read this and will fix the problems in the British Empire. This is 100 years ago. They send one out, of course, to the great philosopher and Christian thinker of the time, G.K. Chesterton. What's, what's the problem? Time of London, the Times of London invited several major thinkers and authors to respond to the question, what's wrong? What's wrong with the British Empire? What's wrong with the world? Chesterton's contribution took this form. Here's his response that was printed in the paper. 
Dear Sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. There's, there's his answer. What's wrong with the British Empire? What's wrong with the world? Everything's falling. It's the same thing. Everything's falling apart. The church, I mean, Chesterton wrote it, the church is totally falling apart in, in, in the British Empire. The country lost. And they even call it the lost generation that comes out of World War II. I mean, World War I. I mean, it's just everything's his answer. Dear sirs, what's the problem? I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What's, 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 uh, where do we have to start? We sit down, confess our sin. We fast. We weep. We mourn. We pray. Ultimately, what's the next part of the prayer? And through the rest of it, we need to repent. If that's what's wrong with the country, as we close here today, what's the answer to our country's problems? I want, I want to read a couple paragraphs here from this uh, commentary from Pastor uh, Thomas. He says, If sin is the cause of the Jews' plight in Jerusalem, Turning from it back to God is the answer. How is that done? Repentance, faith. That's the remedy. Because it's a turning. Repentance is, I'm, here's God, all right? I'm sinning, I'm going this way, and I'm doing my own thing. Repentance is a turning away from sin. Faith is a turning back to God. That's the answer. The answer is a turning away from sin and turning back to God. And that's for all of us. Part of the problem is, one of the podcasts that I was talking about, uh, Matt Walsh on the Daily Wire, he's wrote a book, what is it, Church of Cowards? But uh, that's, that's the name of his, his, his problem. He said, that's the answer. The, the answer is in America today, the church is a bunch of cowards and a bunch of wimps. They won't, they won't speak the truth, which is one of the things we're going to do in this, in, this, in this Bible study that's starting Sunday. You know, Christians living in a woke world, a call to courage, confession, and love. That's the subtitle of the study done by Pastor Dare, who's an LCMS pastor, works with Doxology, the group that I'm affiliated with. It's an advanced training for pastors. It's a pastor up in Michigan. And that's called courage. That's one of the things that needs to be there in, in repentance is the church is please allow us to speak with courage, confession, conviction, but as Paul says, speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in, in love. But it's kind of what Vodi Bakum had two weeks ago. Jesus says, I really do love you. Therefore, what you're doing is, is wrong because it's going to destroy you now and eternally. And that's why Pastor Thomas here says, repentance and faith is the remedy. And he says, what? I'll just read the paragraph. Repentance, exclamation point. It is the missing element in the modern church. We are far more concerned with forgiveness today in the modern church than repentance. Which forgiveness means God loves you just the way you are, so you can now do whatever it is that you want to do. Which is what he says. We want the blessings without the pain of turning our back on sin. We skate so closely to the grace promised by the gospel in abundance that we fall headlong into sinning, as Paul says, that grace may abound. That becomes our mentality. Nehemiah, though, as we will see, will have none of that. He understands all too clearly that apart from genuine heartfelt repentance and turning from sin to God, there is no forgiveness. There is no forgiveness. Because if we're not repenting, how can you receive forgiveness? Because there's no recognition that there is a sin. Therefore, God can't forgive it. See, that's the problem. The church today, which is out there, God loves you just the way you are. Do whatever it is that you want to do. If you watch the little thing with Dylan Mulvaney this past week, yeah. who's the, the influencer on TikTok, mm -hmm. who is the guy, the dude who was an actor, who now dresses up and plays a Disney princess, but claims to be has gone through surgery and is celebrating 365 days of girlhood and had the little thing at the Rockefeller Center this past week and now Budweiser's got her on the can oh, the Bud White and she's now modeling Nike women's underwear 
and everything else. And it's, and it's it's a dude. It's a dude. It's a dude. But if you watch the Rockefeller thing, she's, she's dressed up as the Disney princess singing a Disney song. It's the cheesiest thing I've ever seen. And it's almost like this is what Rome was doing with the stupidity in their theaters that they're doing. And we're doing it today. And then she's singing the song and she stopped. I just, I want to stop for a minute. I know this will offend a lot of you, but that's how she, but I still want to have a relationship with God. Because I believe God's made me just the way that I am. And, and God would never hate me like all those other people who are haters out there. And just goes on and on. And everybody's sitting there and they're the other trans people on the stage. Everybody's just yeah. weeping and everything else. This is the Rockefeller Center. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a joke what all this is. People are play acting. It's a costume the guy's put on. I know he's gone through the surgeries and everything else. But it's just, it's just ridiculous. But the whole idea is there's no need for repentance. Because this God has made me. But love is, yes, God, God says it's wrong. But our society, we were looking for readers for, for Mel to read, read and comprehend the pictures and all that. And it was phenomenal. We could not find any current books for him to read that didn't have fantasy Unicorns, fantasy, all this stuff is fantasy, and that's drilled in the kids from it is. kindergarten yeah. on. Live in fantasy. I want you to be can create princess. your own reality you instead of the actual that. reality that's, that's actually we here. We back to Dick and Jane to find a book for him to read. Yeah, we could, but every, everything is make believe now, yeah. where you get to create your own reality. But it's what the kids put on the Oculus, and they create, you know, their their their. They put on the Oculus and they're now climbing the Alps. I mean, I put the I put the Oculus on when the kids got it from Christmas. Timothy gave them an Oculus. You know, you put on the thing and now I'm I'm, I'm climbing. And it looks like man, I couldn't do it because it felt like I was falling when I missed the thing. And it's like I'm falling and going to go splat. You know, as I'm climbing the Alps. But you know, I create my own reality, and that's what we have taught the kids. And Dylan Mulvaney is a perfect example of that. I can become and celebrate 365 days of girlhood. But he thinks being a girl is being a Disney princess. But actually he's a eunuch. And that's, well, no, he's not. because. But I don't want to get into that because if you watch TikTok, I'll <laughs> <laughs> tell you, he's not. Yeah. Okay, so that, they're really playing a the game. Yeah, he really is playing a game, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. This gets to be perverse yeah, beyond belief. And he'll let you know about it. But see, this is what our kids are watching. Serious? This is this is what our kids are watching, and that's the problem, right? And that's the reality that that they're that they're getting in school in 24 hours a day. But what we're going to have to do is we have to call people to repentance because if there's no repentance, there can be no forgiveness and there can be no love. Because what is God forgiving? Something has to be wrong in order to be forgiven. But the man doesn't acknowledge the sin. Correct. Therefore, not, not but see, I want, I want God, but I want no what? I want no repentance. Mm -hmm. I want no faith. I want a God of my own choosing and making. See, that's it. Because I'm ultimately God. But see, everybody buys into it. That going back to Christine's point, I can actually just create my own reality. I also create my own God, mm -hmm. who looks, thinks, and acts correctly, just like me. Yeah. yeah. Just, the, just the same as me. But that's Notice his prayer. Talks about God, then his, his unfaithfulness. Yes. It, it, the churches, the countries, mine, my family. And we have sinned, notice, against who? What we have in our liturgy. I have sinned against God. you. What, what does David say in Psalm 51? Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Today, David has, what, what's, what's, what's David repenting of? He's just following his own heart, he's being his true authentic self. There's a beautiful woman. In order for me to be my true authentic self, I've got to have that lady. Because that's just me. Today, we would say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You're just being your true authentic self. So, because that's what's in here. It's what I feel. And whatever I feel, I have to be able to express. do and express. Otherwise, I can't be myself. Which David was being his true authentic self. Dylan Mulvaney's being his true authentic self. 
I'm being my true authentic self because my true authentic self is I confess that I am a poor miserable sinner. See, notice how Satan has worded that. You got The only way to find fulfillment and happiness is to be your true authentic self. No, being your true authentic self will destroy you because you'll be a sinner. I need to get rid of my sin. And against you only have I sinned and done what is evil. We have acted very corruptly against you. We have not kept your commandments, your statutes, the rules you have commanded your servant Moses. Our sin is against God. And so they'll come at you and say, Oh, judge not that you shall not be judged. It's the only verse they know in the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it's true. Because if you wanted my personal judgment, my personal judgment may be, Hey, live and let live, man. You want to dress up like a Disney princess and get your picture on a Bud Light can and have Kid Rock shoot it all up? Go for it, man. All right, if you want to cause barroom brawls and everybody's fighting now in the bars, they say, that serve Bud Light because everybody's fighting over all this. Man, if that's what you want your life to be all about and you want to model Nike underwear and you're a dude and want to do that for women, fine. Cool. But that's, that's my judgment. But that's why I judge not. It's not my judgment. It's God's, God's judgment. This is what God has to say about it. I, I don't judge. But my parents, my parents have okayed me. Fine, but that, that's not the judgment. The judgment is God's judgment. All my friends have said, now I'm really my true authentic self. Well, great, Dylan, but that's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not God's judgment. And that's, that's, that's the whole point. But we can't pick people out because we have to remember we do exactly the same thing. This sin is okay in my life because blah, 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 blah. And we've got a, a rationale, an excuse. There's, there's some reason behind it. And so Nehemiah is saying, yes, all of these sins that are causing great trouble and shame, everything is falling apart. Yet it's, it's the people, it's the church, it's the country, but even I and my father's house, my family. We've all sinned. I have sinned. And so the repentance needs to start with, what's wrong? Remember the question, what's wrong with the British Empire? What's wrong with the world? Chesterton's contribution took the form of this letter, Dear Sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world? It's me. And that's where repentance has to start with my house, has to start with my family, has to start with my church. And then we move on. Gene? Just quickly, in the prayer, Nehemiah is praying for the whole people of mm -hmm. Israel. And it's like, okay, are they the rest of the people recognizing their need for repentance or not? You know, he's just praying to God on behalf of the people. Right. And I, and I think that's something that we all do even for our kids or our grandkids or our brother or sister or a friend. Um, the oh Lord, continue to bring them to repentance. Bring me to repentance. He's confessing their sins. Mm -hmm. Have they um, acknowledged? Have they acknowledged those? Yeah. See, that's the problem. And when when we finally get there, and he read, you know, Ezra, and and they read the scriptures, then hey, what do I need to do? It's kind of like after Peter's great Pentecost sermon, the word of God will ultimately bring them to repentance. Well, yeah, the Holy Spirit doing the work. Yeah, the Holy Spirit does the work. Yeah. yeah. Nehemiah can't. I can't bring anybody to repentance. I'd love to, because it's the thing. Sometimes it drives me nuts because you're wa it, whether you're a pastor dealing with a counseling situation or you're looking in our country today. In our country today, you're seeing two trains and they're going 150 mile they're bullet trains in Europe and they're going right at each other. And you know they're going to hit and blow each other up, and you like to yell and scream, "Stop!" And you see the same thing in your kids' lives or a cousin or a friend or whatever, and stop. But it, it, and you want to be in the results business, but we can't. We can't be. And so that's the thing. So let's, let's close here by finishing up this prayer. And then, then verses, because we've got to get to the gospel. Verses 8 through 10. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you. That's happened. But, he says, God, you remember... You're right, and you did scatter us. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though you're outcasts in the uttermost parts of heaven, 
From there I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Here, here's the interesting thing is, he reminds God of his promises. And then going back to Hosea, you're married to us. You can't divorce us. You're stuck with us. So, O oh Lord, bring us to repentance. We're, we're your people. He, he reminds them, you, we, are, we are your people. They, those people are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed. You saved them. Now, please, Lord. Now, notice they don't have to become good to get in. God already saved them. Now, I pray that you'll make them act like the people they already are. This is moralism. Now, be who you already are. You don't have to become somebody to get into the family. You've already been adopted in. Now, act like you're already in. And that's, that's what... And so, the, that, that covenant promise, that covenant there of marriage, we looked at the book of Hosea. You know, we, we have had the divorce from God. God won't divorce us. Now bring us to repentance to bring us back and remind the people they are your people and you're not going to divorce them. You're never going to leave them. You're never going to forsake them. And so now we pray that that will now, that gospel promise will produce what? Repentance in the people. So that as we get to verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. There's other people besides me who are praying. They delight to fear your name. First command, fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Fear here is a good thing. To have that reverential awe. Fear, love, and trust in God. They delight to fear His name. And so, so that, and I think something that we have to, we could spend more time on, but in order for God's ears to be open to our prayers, in order for His ears to be open, He's got to cover up our sin. That's why we have that at the start. Now that my sin is forgiven and covered, now as a forgiven child of God, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, now I can enter into God's presence. And He will hear my prayer. And that's, that's so this flow is the flow of prayer, flow of worship. And so as you, as you kind of um, think about this, and we'll think about this to close, look at the end of verse... 11 there, grant mercy in the sight of this man. Ha have mercy for me. And remember, he's planning something in God's ears. Have mercy through me. Because, remember God, I've been thinking about it. I'm a cupbearer. I'm an advisor to the king. Could you actually use me to make a change? And I think the interesting thing is, I want you to be thinking about this week, where has God placed you? You're not the Secretary of the Treasury. You're not a Supreme Court Justice. You're not the Governor of the State of Indiana. But God has given you callings and vocations in your life. How can you be used by God in those situations? Now, it doesn't mean that that's going to enact change in your family or in Plymouth or in the church. But we're placing ourselves into God's hands that please use me in my everyday callings. That I can be light and salt and real love out in the world because you are interacting with people I'll never meet, I'll never know, I'll never have contact with. You can't say, oh, but pastor does evangelism. Well, how, how am I going to meet any of these people that you run into? I, I don't even know they exist. So that God has placed you in those particular callings like Nehemiah. Grant mercy in the sight of this man. Because remember... You can maybe use me. And God also, if we're going to begin to make changes in this world, instead of cursing the darkness, light a match. Light a match and be light and salt. That's why God sprinkles. You are the light of the world. You are the salt. You know, the city on a hill that's lit up is there so everybody can see it. You don't light a lamp and then cover it up. You turn it on so there's light. It's this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Yeah, and that's and that's it. God is now going to use Nehemiah, and that's what we're going to see here next week. And I think that's some great, some great application. So let's uh, go ahead here, and we'll uh, close with a uh, word of prayer. 
Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we're going to work our way here through the book of Nehemiah, we so, see so many things that are similar to where we're at in our own families, church, uh, cities, and nation. And we pray that just as you're going to use Nehemiah uh, to bring about repentance and faith and trust and change, we pray that you would use us where you plant us and put us on a daily basis. May we come to you each and every day remembering who you are and your promise and who we are, but knowing that what we were as sinners were now your redeemed children, that we would live in, in your kingdom. And as Luther reminds us in the Catechism, to serve you uh, in willingness and righteousness, that we could live under you and your kingdom and serve you in willing obedience daily. Uh, bless us, O Lord, where we fall short, forgive. Uh, where we need strength, bring us that comfort and strength to live as your redeemed children daily, that we can begin to enact change in those around us. For we ask your blessing upon us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.